will come and uh, be a good nucleophile and uh, attack the carbon in the acetyl group, making acetyl-CoA and breaking it off from the oxidized uh, uh, with oil group. Um, so uh, now we have produced acetyl-CoA and we have our um, lipoil group that's not, no longer linked to anything anymore. So this happened in E2. We, we produced our acetyl-CoA. So really, this is the primary reason why we're even talking about this complex is because we start with pyruvate and we produce acetyl-CoA. Everything else from now on in this complex, and there's a few more things, um, is to get everything back to its starting point so that further pyruvates can react here. And we don't you know, we have to do this more than once. Uh, and remember, enzyme active sites need to be reconverted back to normal. Um, for example, this is gonna need to get back to normal and there's other co-binates too. Okay, so involved in this is another co-vector. Uh, in this case, this is a, this is basically acts as a pre-study group in this complex. Um, it's not going to leave the complex. And that's FAD. Uh, it acts similar to what NAD did um, in it gaining and accepting electrons. Um, in this case, FAD is going to accept two electrons and two protons. Here's the structure of FAD. This is FADH2 when it is um, reduced. So here's the oxidized form, here is the reduced form, and it's going to be involved in this. Now, it can also accept just a single electron, so it actually has a choice. In this mechanism, it's going to accept two electrons, which is right on top. <clears throat> okay. Um, and we'll also see FAD in the citric acid cycle in a little bit, too. So it also uh, acts on a different enzyme in a redox step um, to accept electrons. Okay, so uh, the next step then is that we have to, um, uh, uh, we have to reduce. Um, or sorry, re-oxidize this lipoil lysine, the lipoil group here, uh, re-oxidize it back over here. To do that, we're going to um, uh, involve uh, uh, re reducing FAD uh, here to FADH2. So this is going to be, so in E2 we have the lipoil lysine, and in E3, that's where the FAD is present. And they're kind of like right next to each other in the complex, so it's sort of like form joint active site between E2 and E3. Um, and what this will cause then is this reoxidation of the uh, of the foil lysine part here back so that it can react with another acetic group later. So now though, we have FADH2, and we need to get FADH2 back to FAD so that this can happen again later. So that, that's the next step. Um, and so now we have to talk about what happens in NAD3. So this involves uh, using NAD plus um, to oxidize FAD uh, to FA, FADH2 back to FAD. Um, and so we use the NAD plus and we generate NADH from the step. And so this is a, you know, that's just our normal NAD plus NADH thing here. So it is using glycolysis and everything. And so that is just a cofactor that comes in and leaves. So technically, this is another product of this of this complex. We produce NADH, and that will leave the complex. FAD is going to just stay in the complex. So now everything is back to its normal state. We produce pyruvate, um, uh, sorry, produce acetyl-CoA um, from pyruvate very good. So this is just a summary um, of what all these steps are, uh, I want you to know, um, you don't need, so it would help because you'd actually be able to know, uh, based off of these enzyme names, more about what's happening in each complex. But um, I want you to just be able to refer to them as E1, E2, and E3. Um, I'm not going to have the specific enzyme names for those. Uh, uh, but I do want you to know what uh, uh, prosthetic groups and what and, and what is being, what's happening in each of these complexes. So like what product is there, if it's prosthetic or TPP and E1, if, wait, what complex you produce acetyl-CoA, things like that. Um, function of E3, uh, sort, of, sort of that level here is what, what I'm hoping you uh, remember for the uh, exam. Okay, so, um, other questions on this very complex, yeah. So we don't have to recognize like, the mechanisms from one to the other, or? Um, no, but it, it involves oxidation reduction. You need to tell them, like, know what the oxidation state is. Not, I guess what I'm getting is I'm not expecting you to draw all these mechanisms and um, really draw any of the, this uh, of this stuff. So. 
to be able to drop an acetyl-CoA, just like this integer linked to CoA, that would be pretty easy. And of course, if I move it, you need to know that anyway. But none of the intermediate stuff inside here would be a requirement. The chemical stuff, the mechanism stuff to drop. Um, more, more questions about this? Okay. Um, so, uh, pyruvate, acetyl CoA. That's kind of the mind thing what's happening here. Um, so now we have acetyl CoA, and now we can um, uh, uh, sort of get to the citric acid cycle. Um, technically, we're producing acetyl CoA. We do produce CO2 because that's uh, one of the carbons that goes away from pyruvate as a form of CO2. And we also technically produce NADH. So, this is sort of the overall balanced equation for what comes into as a substrate and releases a product for the pyruvate dehydrogenase compounds. So throughout the whole thing, D1, D2, and D3, <coughs> together will produce all this. Okay. So now we can actually get into the citric acid cycle. Like, sure you were all learned about that. Um, and uh, so now this um, we have we're in the mitochondria matrix. So the, all that E1, E2, E3 stuff was in the matrix of the mitochondria. Everything was brought into there after the end of the glycolysis. And now uh, there's eight different reactions that are going to start with acetyl CoA and get us uh, kind of going in a cycle all the back all the way back around. In the process, we are going to um, uh, basically. Uh, do some oxidation, we're going to generate some reduced cofactors and one, uh, one GTP. So we don't actually have very much actual substrate level phosphorylation here, but all these reduced cofactors are going to be able to, be, to generate a lot of ATP later in the um, uh, electron transport chain. So um, the overall uh, regulation of this, uh, as we'll sort of see built into um, when I talk about each step, uh, is product inhibition. So product inhibition of most steps is uh, sort of regulating the flux through this cycle. Um, also, there's going to be three irreversible steps that we we'll talk about that are also heavily regulated um, to ensure that flux through this cycle is uh, uh, happening at the right rate. Okay. So eight steps. Um, the summary is that acetyl-CoA comes in and it gets combined to um, literally carbon-carbon bond formation here, uh, combined with oxaloacetate. So oxaloacetate, we talked about that as one of the early steps of gluconeogenesis. Um, now this is its role, that molecule's role in the mitochondria matrix in the citric acid cycle. So acetyl-CoA and oxaloacetate will be combined together. We lose the, co the, the coenzyme A from this, so that sort of goes away. Um, we react and reconvert the thing around a little bit. Uh, we generate, we have a, a redox reaction down here. We generate some NADH and then another one. Um, adding CoA back in, we generate GTP and uh, technically that's not ATP, but we can think of when you see GTP that it effectively is equivalent to an ATP. So that would be uh, this, this cycle only substrate level phosphorylation. Um, and then we generate uh, FADH2, which um, uh, I just introduced a little bit ago in the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. Um, it, it can also generate ATP later, but not quite as much as an ADH. That will we'll explain a little bit. And then lastly, one more NADH here in the last step. And we're back to oxaloacetate um, at the very end. So we come in starting with acetyl-CoA effectively, and that cycles all the way back around to produce oxaloacetate. Um, at the very end. Okay, so <clears throat> going through the different steps. Um, so uh, we have acetyl CoA here that was produced by the dehydrogenase complex and oxaloacetate. Oxaloacetate has four carbons, all those carboxy groups, and we have two carbons from acetyl CoA. What we're going to have here is citrate synthase. This is going to make a car uh, basically. We're going to add water and kick off the CoA that's on the acetyl CoA, so the CoA leaves. Um, and we now have the six carbon citrate. So a carbon carbon bond formation here between acetyl, the acetyl group of acetyl CoA, and oxaloacetate. That CoA group activated that carbon so that it enabled this to basically be something that could actually happen. 
Um, so if it was just in the CD group on its own, this is not going to happen. You need that CoA there to make that a more active part. <clears throat> okay, um, now uh, very strongly negative standard for energy change. This is pretty much irreversible um, and really dictates whether or not the whole cycle uh, sets the uh, rate for the rate, uh, sets the rate for the whole cycle. So this is a pretty important enzyme here. Um, if this is really active, then the whole flux of the cycle will be much higher. If this is really lower, it'll be much lower flux. Um, now, this is a uh, an induced fit mechanism. There's actually an order to how this has to, actually has to happen here. Um, oxaloacetate binds to the enzyme active site, uh, causes a conformation change in the active site that allows then for a cyclical way to bind, and then the reaction of carbon-carbon uh, bond formation actually occurs. So it's sort of like a very specific order. Um, that CoA, uh, acetyl-CoA is a pretty high energy molecule. You don't want to make, break off that CoA before acetyl, uh, oxaloacetate is bound, or else you kind of would just um, uh, break off the CoA and you wouldn't be in bond, carbon carbon bond formation. <clears throat> so, um, very favorable reaction, irreversible. Uh, it's highly regulated by um, primarily substrate availability, so oxaloacetate at the end of the whole cycle, that has to be a high enough level so they can activate this enzyme here um, by binding first or to the core So you have to have enough this oxaloacetate for this to uh, occur and also product inhibition. <clears throat> okay, now uh, this is just that induced fit here. Um, just to ensure that acetyl-CoA is not broken apart before oxaloacetate is there. Is that you have to coordinate this to happen in the order of oxaloacetate binds, then acetyl-CoA binds, then we break off the CoA and link the acetyl group to oxaloacetate at the same time. Um, so that's sort of very, very important here that you don't break this very high energy acetyl-CoA molecule before oxaloacetate is there. Now, um, this is just showing <coughs> The order here um, in this induced bit, where you only form the active enzyme here when um, oxaloacetate binds first. <clears throat> okay, uh, well, and also, I guess this also shows that there, um, that technically this enzyme forms a complex, a dimer, um, so there's actually two active sites, so one complex can interact with two, um, two substrates at the same time, but uh, this is a persistent synthase. Okay. Now, the next reaction, this is a conotase. So now there's a little bit of reconfiguration that happens in this, in this step. Um, and uh, there's sort of two parts of this. There's a, there's a dehydration and a rehydration step that it happens, and it happens stereospecifically. Um, so we have a citrate uh, here, and we have a conotase here due by dehydration. We lose these uh, loses this water over here. And instead of that water now, we have a cis double, uh, a cis double bond that's formed here in cis acanitate as an intermediate. And then we rehydrate it uh, to form isocitrate. So effectively, now if you look at the beginning and the uh, end here, um, we have gone from uh, a hydroxyl at that carbon and a, a, a proton here to start swapping. So isocitrate and citrate are very similar, but just different positions of their hydroxyl groups on there. And um, like I mentioned, this is very stereo-specific. We form cisacontate in, in the middle here so that we ensure that we um, add the hydroxyl at the correct position. Uh, this is not very spontaneous, but um, because the, sort of, the energetics of the first reaction are so spontaneous, that usually if that first enzyme uh, pushes it forward, it'll get over this um, energy hump here, and this reaction will occur uh, directly forming. Uh, uh, Going, going forward to make the product. Now, um, this is a lias, uh, basically it's a lias type enzyme, um, using water to form that carbon-carbon double bond. Uh, and um, what this is going to be here is that uh, the step after this is an oxidation reaction, and just a little bit of brief rationale for why you're doing this. Um, and the oxidation reaction is much easier with isocitrate than it is citrate, so that's why we have to reconfigure this, so that the next step of oxidation after this step of the process is much more um, energetically favorable. Now, uh, this um, 
Once again, this is forming cis aconitate, very, very specifically. It does this because in the enzyme active sites, I'll show in a second, there are these things called iron sulfur clusters that coordinate the substrate um, to ensure that it, that stabilizes the negative charge uh, in, a, in a very specific way. Um, and so that's what this looks like in the center. You have your citrate molecule here, um, and this is an iron sulfur cluster. So basically, uh, this is the enzyme um, uh, here, and different cysteines, the sulfur, uh, <coughs> the, the R groups of those cysteines are linked to iron in this um, iron sulfur, uh, iron sulfur cluster, basically. Um, and the positive charge that's on these irons here, that's going to uh, interact with the active site, with the water and with the, um, the parts of the, the part of the citrate that's going to go away uh, and sort of help stabilize this. So this is what I mean by this iron sulfur cluster. They're also, these iron sulfur clusters are seen heavily in the electron transport chain, so they're also important if you end up getting into more of that in other classes. Um, uh, very important for uh, coordinating uh, charges like this, uh, and also for elect uh, electron tra transport. <clears throat> okay. So now we have isocitrate. So isocitrate got formed, and what we want to do now is we want to form alpha ketoglutarate. Now this is the um, first oxidation step of the cycle. So really, we started by sort of disassembling everything, rearranging it, and now in the third step, we're actually going to generate something beneficial from this cycle here. So we're going to generate NAD plus, NADH plus proton, um, and uh, so this is a dehydration reaction. This is a metal, uh, specifically a metal ion um, oxidation that there's a mag manganese in the enzyme that will coordinate and neutralize the <coughs> negative charges that develop here and enable this uh, uh, basically oxidative decarboxylation to occur. Now, what that means then is this CO2, this carboxyl group here, that is going to um, go away as CO2 in this step. So we're going to lose a carbon in the form of CO2, and we're also going to oxidize, uh, oxidize the isocitrate to alpha glutarate. So we form the NADH plus proton. Okay, um, this, so now we're down to five carbons, effectively. So effectively this process builds up. We have six carbons and we lose one, we lose another one later, generate um, uh, reduced cofactors along the way. Now this um, very irreversible, very uh, spontaneous reaction. So this is heavily pushed forward here in these products. So that whole generation of isocitrate makes this reaction even more beneficial because this is much easier to decarboxylate than it was in the previous citrate form. Okay. So um, oxidative decarboxylation, we've talked about that quite a few times so far. We lose CO2, we oxidize, generate NADH, and um, we get a ketone that gets produced. Now, uh, this is regulated mainly by product inhibition and ATP. So if you have a lot of ATP, this is going to be inhibited. Um, once again, this, this process is effectively going to generate ATP later, so the, the whole cycle will get turned down if you have a lot of ATP. And if you're producing a lot of product, eventually that product will slow down the cycle. Okay. Remember, this is isocitrate dehydrogenase that's carrying out that reaction. Okay, so now there's a slight rebuilding step that happens. Um, and so this is, uh, and it's also the, the, the final oxidative decarboxylation. And so I say rebuilding because we're adding coenzyme A back on, um, but in the process we're actually losing another CO2 and doing another oxidation step. So it's sort of all in one. Um, this is called alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex. Um, it takes alpha ketoglutarate and it generates succinyl OA plus CO2. Uh, we need to have another fresh coenzyme A that comes in, that gets added to the glutarate to form sustenyl CoA, and we have NAD plus comes in, we generate NADH when we oxidize the alpha glutarate, and we lose the CO2. So, final oxidative decarboxylation that happens. Not the last time we generate reduced cofactors, but 
specifically oxidative decarboxylation. We don't have another CO2 that we can use. Um, now, this is a, uh, we're generating another very high energy um, uh, thiol ester group, uh, that, that loop from the molecule to the CoA. That's a number that's a very high energy bond. So we're generating that in the step in the form of succinyl CoA now, not a CO-CoA, but a succinyl CoA. Same idea, now that CoA bond is going to be another very high energy bond that we can get energy back from later. Um, and uh, very uh, irreversible, super favorable reaction here. Um, this is primarily going to be regulated by product inhibition. So once again, you know, if you don't want this thing, you want to control at some point, you have a lot of product being formed here, you would eventually inhibit that that's uh, inhibit this reaction. Okay. Now, a little aside about this complex. Um, besides, uh, so it's actually very similar to the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex um, that generated the acetyl-CoA. Um, so, so, you know, remember we did that at the very beginning today. Um, they have uh, E1 and sort of um, some similar setup, same, same coenzymes, uh, uh, same, same, basically generally the same type of mechanism um, with uh, sort of these large complex, so basically the alpha-Q uh, glutarate dehydrogenase has multiple components that act very similar to the pyruvate dehydrogenase. Um, in this case, you're taking alpha-Q glutarate to sustenyl CoA, you lose the CO2, generate NDH, and then before we have pyruvate going to acetyl CoA. So uh, very similar in how, the, uh, how these things work. Um, and like the mega, like the foil ass, uh, uh, the foil lysine, um, all uh, FAD, all that stuff in the complex is very similar to these two. Okay. Um, take a quick second to mention. So I've we talked about you know lose, this is the last decarboxylation, so we're not going to lose any more carbons. Um, but sort of keep track of what carbon we have lost. Um, so you start with acetyl-CoA and oxaloacetate. If you label these in the lab, like radiation can follow where these are coming from, uh, where, where these are coming and going throughout these reactions. Now the carbons that initially come in as acetyl-CoA, remember those came, so if you want to have ties all the way back to like glucose being converted into pyruvate, pyruvate into acetyl-CoA, right? I want to say, okay, where did the carbons from glucose, where are they ending up here? Um, well, now they're coming in, they're adding here to form citrate, and during one first start, so, so step one, two, three, and four, this is the acid cycle, the, the carbons that we lose as CO, CO2 are actually not the carbons that, that, that came in um, in this very first round from acetyl-CoA. So what that means is to actually uh, get rid of, get rid of, uh, get rid of the carbons that come in as a CO-CoA, uh, as CO2 in the cycle, this would have to go around twice for this to happen. Um, uh, for, for you actually to have the, um, get rid of these carbons here that come in um, uh, during, during, uh, during the cycle. So the cycle has to go around twice to lose those carbons that initially, initially came from places like glucose. Now, if I talk about yields or anything on there, don't get confused with uh, assuming that this has to go around twice. This is just a this would be a specific question related to the getting rid of the specific carbons. I don't want you to assume that it has to go around twice. Um, um, and, you know, don't don't be confused with that. But just to talk about where these carbons are actually leaving, um, and they're not leaving. Uh, uh, they're not they're not leaving in the first round from uh, the bunch of anions. Yeah. So, and then they wouldn't really have to go that route, right, if uh, the body was going through starvation mode. So they would just go from acetyl-CoA to oxaloacetate, back to mallet, back to PEP, and then go back through glycolysis. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, uh, when, that's a good question. Uh, when gluconeogenesis, exactly, when glu starvation mode, Gluconeogenesis would be would be encouraged. Oxaloacetate would be funneling into gluconeogenesis, and that would mean there's less of it for the citric acid cycle. And I said initially that the first step of what of the citric acid cycle needs to have enough oxaloacetate. So yeah, if, if you're doing gluconeogenesis, you're probably not going to do much citric acid cycle. So it would just come down, go to oxaloacetate, and then go up 
out of the mitochondria back yeah. outside of the cell. Yeah. And you can get to acetyl-CoA from other, so we only talk about, I don't want to get too much detail because that's a lot of stuff that I can talk about later. <laughs> um, but acetyl-CoA can come from a lot of other things, not just break down glucose. So breaking down fatty acids, you get a whole bunch of acetyl-CoA. Okay. More questions about that? Okay, so um, now remember that's just halfway through the citric acid cycle. I'm a little over halfway through now. Uh, but now we have um, succinyl CoA synthetase. Um, this is going to be uh, the only substrate level phosphorylation in the whole cycle. So this is where we actually generate GTB, GTB um, here. Uh, so we have succinyl CoA, we bring in GDP and an inorganic phosphate to form our GTB. And in the process, we also get rid of that high energy CoA, uh, coenzyme A. Uh, so basically, this high energy bond here, that's going to break. Think of that as like hydrolysis of ATP. Um, that's a very energetically favorable reaction, very spontaneous. So that breaking of that CoA bond is going to effectively pay for, energy speaking, the formation of GTP. Uh, so that's how we sort of get this. Uh, it's kind of a couple of reactions. Um, and this is sort of uh, talking about it down here, where um, this reaction of breaking off this CoA to form succinate is going to be very spontaneous, negative 32 uh, kilojoules per mole, and that will sort of pay for the uh, formation of the GTP. So that that formation is very very not spontaneous, thir plus 30 uh, kilojoules per mole. But this sort of because this is happening in a um, Couple of reactions, then net free energy is still just slightly negative. So that means that this is a spontaneous reaction here. Um, and because, because we're coupling the breaking of this very, very high energy bond to the formation of the G. Okay. Now, um, so sulfate level phosphorylation, we're taking inorganic phosphate and we're adding it to adenosine or guanosine diphosphate to make guanosine triphosphate. Um, and uh, there is a, an intermediate in the enzyme where we actually add a phosphate in there. I won't get into much detail about that. Um, but the idea here is that uh, we produce GTP, and we can think of that as pretty much functioning very similar to GTP. This is reversible, so the, the net free energy change is pretty close to zero. So this is not, not totally irreversible, it's reversible, uh, uh, but it's still a relatively uh, spontaneous reaction, so it does proceed forward and make products. Okay, um, it is typically though, so when the cycle is running, there's a product of uh, succinate, the next reaction is very spontaneous, so usually succinate concentrations are very low, um, and so typically when the cycle is running, it's pushed very strongly to be making more succinate. <coughs> okay. Now, um, reaction six, uh, we have succinate gonna be converted to fumarate. Now, this involves that cofactor or prosthetic group, FAD. So, FAD is going to uh, generate the reduced version FADH2. So, we're going to generate FADH2 um, in this step uh, and oxidize succinate to fumarate. Now, um, kind of a draw here that looks like we're at zero or so, not, not, not super spontaneous, um, but it will uh, typically occur. The cycle running through um, because of the early reactions that push it through. Uh, so, succinate dehydrogenase is what this reaction is. And um, this is the, the sort of asterisk in the, in the positioning of all the enzymes in the citric acid cycle. So, um, this is actually an enzyme embedded in the inner mitochondria membrane. So, it's facing the matrix. So, everything's happening in the matrix of the mitochondria, all these enzymes. Um, but this one specifically is linked right into the membrane. Now this is important because that FADH2 that is um, uh, generated in this step, that is actually gonna be a direct feed into the electron transport chain. Um, this is one of the entry points to the electron transport chain, basically. Um, uh, so it's gonna just link right into that and you'll be able to make, um, uh, make ATP from that later. Um, Okay, so uh, uh, a little bit different here about why it's FAD and not FADH2. 
This is also referred to as complex two, so you might hear, you might have heard of like electron transport chain complex one, two, three, four. Um, and this is the another name for this enzyme um, is complex two in the electron transport chain. Okay, so now you have fumarate. Fumarate here um, is going to uh, make L malate. So this is going to take um, uh, do a hydration across um, uh, this double bond here to form the L configuration of mal. Uh, it's going to go through this transition state in the middle here um, uh, that then um, uh, gets propagated to lock it into the malate form. Uh, this is a kind of spontaneous, not, not super negative, um, but, but it's going to get us back to L, it gives two L malate and that will get us back to the finishing of the cycle. So this is stereospecific. Um, you know, notice L malate. It's not going to ever produce D malate. It's always going to use L malate. Uh, this water across this trans. So first of all, this is a, basically this is a trans double bond. Um, even though it's kind of it looks like it's a sort of um, uh, it looks sort of like it's uh, symmetric, but as it interacts into the active side of the enzyme, it actually it, it always interacts in the same way and always uh, it configures into the L malate state. Um, so this is uh, what's referred to as like prochiral, basically, uh, where the fumarate is going to always generate the L malate and never generates the D malate, even though this is pretty symmetric right here. Um, and uh, this is just the way that it interacts in the active site of the enzyme. I won't get into much more detail about it than that. Now, um, reversible reaction here, uh, pretty, if it's favorable, still negative, um, kind of just pushes, pushes the reaction forward. And then um, that product concentration, which is pretty much a trend with all these steps, the product concentration in this, in this, in this step, the, the, the L malate that gets formed, is pretty quickly uh, kept, kept very low for the next reaction. So then this next reaction is the end of the cycle. We take L malate and we generate oxaloacetate, we regenerate, I guess, oxaloacetate. So we're going back to, you know, it's a cycle. So um, it's going around and we generate oxaloacetate. This is a oxidation here. So we have NADH that gets generated from malate dehydrogenase when we um, oxidize L malate. Uh, and so um, this is one that um, sort of is very, very not spontaneous. You know, standard free energy chain is really, really high. Um, but that first step of the, so this is the end of the cycle, oxaloacetate cell. But when that is generated, just a little bit of that, um, the very first step of the entire cycle is super negative. And so just a little bit of oxaloacetate that gets formed will cause, uh, basically, this, these levels will be pretty low usually. Um, and that's going to uh, drive this whole kind of, uh, the first step of the cycle is going to pull this reaction forward to make more oxaloacetate. So this reaction is pulled forward by the very first step of the citric acid cycle. <clears throat> And we've generated another one of these mediations. Okay. So, um, so that is the uh, malate dehydrogenase, the final step of the cycle. Um, we get our oxaloacetate back. Um, as we talked about, oxaloacetate is a pretty important molecule. It has sort of the very important ramifications for gluconeogenesis as well as the citric acid cycle. Um, so its generation is very important. Um, now, uh, also, uh, generally, the amount of oxaloacetate is kept pretty low. Once again, because this reaction is not really that spontaneous. Um, just enough of it, though, uh, will generate just enough so that it can funnel off the, 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 the start of the citric acid cycle and, and keep it going. Uh, but typically, uh, the levels of oxaloacetate in the cell are relatively low uh, overall. Okay, so, so we look at everything that happened in the citric acid cycle. We have acetyl-CoA, uh, and basically, really the, the important part of the things that are produced is that we generated three NADH, one FADH2, and one GTP. And we also produced two CoA's, would be, you know, I'm sorry, two CO2's and uh, some, some CoA and a couple protons. Uh, but effectively, the most important thing that's produced from the cycle 
is the uh, the reduced cofactors, the three NADHs and the one FADH2, and the GTP. Now you can't think of FADH, so you can think of ATP and GTP as being effectively the same molecule. They're both high energy molecule, they pretty much act the same way. But you can't think of FADH2 and NADH as the same thing. Those uh, are gonna generate different levels of ATP later in the lifetime transport chain. Um, and, uh, okay, so, that's what's really generated here from one acetyl-CoA entering the cell. And that would be one, one cycle, right? So, you know, don't get confused about how many times you have to go around here with the carbon versus what are the yields from one round of the cycle. So this is one round of the cycle here. Okay. So, now yields. So, whenever you see at any of these steps, glycolysis, well, basically glycolysis right here, um, if you see NADH or FADH2 being produced, in the electron transport chain, the oxidative uh, phosphorylation stuff that produces ATP, we get effectively two and a half ATP from one NADH, and we get one and a half ATP from FADH2. Now, I can't explain um, in this class too much. I don't want to get much detail about why it's different levels of, of ATP, and also why it's so basically, experimentally, they show that this oxidative decarboxylation doesn't result in a perfect like integer number of ATP. Um, you kind of think of that as effectively like kind of like in physics, like friction kind of. Just think of that as sort of like suboptimal suboptimality with the reaction. Um, but these, from actual experimental data, it's been shown that you only get two and a half or one and a half ATP. <clears throat> now. If you then look at what happens from one glucose going all the way through glycolysis, and then the remember the dehydrogenase complex, and then into the to, to uh, one round of the citric acid cycle, um, and as you see, remember we take glucose, we get two pyruvates, so two pyruvates, so see two acetyl-CoA's, and then so then these are all happening twice, of course, but from one glucose you can estimate what the total yields would be for everything added together from these processes. And so you have the energy investment phase here, you have minus two ATP at the beginning here, and you get two NADH, that's, that's the only NADH you get from the from glycolysis, and then you have the uh, payoff phase of glycolysis, you get four ATP. Um, two NADH that are produced by two pyruvates going through the two pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, and then all of the NADHs that one GT, or those two GTPs you get from the um, uh, citric acid cycle, and then the FADH2 and then a couple more NADHs. So overall, you get 32, uh, so, and, then, and then if you convert all these, uh, either just adding up the amount of ATP or GTP is produced with this conversion here, um, that two and a half or one and a half uh, year conversion rate, then you add it all up, you get 32 ATP uh, effectively from um, a total, basically, metabolism of one glucose molecule. So, yield wise, I would like you to be able to know how to do this. Um, be able to say X number of glucose, how much total amount of ATP you're getting in this area, going all the way through here. So, when I say total um, here, uh, I hope I make it clear in the test, but it would be going all the way through this whole process. <clears throat> so just knowing, all, so this is sort of the main reason why we talk about this whole metabolism in the first place is generating the ATP, um, and this sort of summarizes the benefits of this entire class, like three weeks or so, of, of, of biochemistry. Okay, other questions about yields? If you ever go on another class and I talk about the electron transport chain, or if you go on to another school or something, um, chapter 19 gets into a lot of detail uh, on this, um, or detail that you probably would ever want to know, but um, it will explain a lot of this about why NADH gets more ATP than, than heavy. Okay. Um, so, uh, the last little bit, I just want to mention a little bit about this, and then I think we might stop early. I don't, I don't want to get into too much of this. Um, 
But overall, there's this thing called amphibolic pathways. Now what this means is that you can have, so we just talked about citric acid cycle related to catabolism. So we're breaking down, oxidizing molecules, generating reduced cofactors, um, that's breakdown. But you can also, as been applied a little bit ago about gluconeogenesis, you can take some of the intermediates of, the, of, of citric acid cycle and plumb them out of citric acid cycle and direct them towards uh, antibiotic pathways, synthesizing molecules, synthesizing glucose, synthesizing other things. Um, and so the citric acid cycle uh, is the amphibolic pathway. Amphibolic pathways are where you can do both catabolism, that they're capable of doing both catabolism and anabolism. Um, now, uh, we have this oxidative catabolism we just talked about where pyruvate from glucose, the carbohydrate, gets funneled through the citric acid cycle. We can also take acetyl-CoA that's produced from the, break, from the oxidation of amino acids and fatty acids and put it through the citric acid cycle. Um, but then these citric acid cycle intermediates, one of them being oxaloacetate, um, can be sort of funneled off of this, and instead of being used to maintain citric acid cycle progress and oxidation, they can be used for other um, biosynthetic reactions instead. <clears throat> so that's where an amphibolic pathway is in general. And now I've mentioned a few things about how this would happen in the citric acid cycle. Okay, so um, we have sort of a very toned down version of the citric acid cycle, but here in the center is this normal cycle with key intermediates that are highlighted. Now, pyruvate, CD-CoA, CD-CoA and oxaloacetate react together to form citrate. When you form citrate, citrate can be used as a precursor for making fatty acids. So biosynthesis of fatty acids, <coughs> alpha-ketoglutarate, that can be used to make um, a, a variety of amino acids and purines. So possibility for a biosynthesis from alpha-ketoglutarate. Sustenium-CoA, that actually is a precursor for making heme. Remember we had talked about hemoglobin and that iron heme uh, prosthetic group in the center? I mean, that doesn't just magically appear. It's a biosynthetic pathway to make that. And one of the starting points from that is sustenium-CoA. Um, Porphyrins are kind of related to that too. Uh, now, um, um, oxaloacetate, that's probably the biggest one. That can be um, converted uh, uh, via that PEP carboxychinase we talked about, um, a couple other steps back to uh, phosphorylone pyruvate, and then through glu gluconeogenesis, make glucose. So that's how, that's really the main one that we've already talked about, where oxaloacetate is sort of the starting point for, um, uh, one of the, basically one of the starting points for gluconeogenesis. Uh, and then also, uh, oxaloacetate can be converted into the amino acids, a couple different amino acids and proteins. Um, now there, just to kind of mention, there's, if, if you're following off too much of this stuff, um, sometimes you need to you know, sort of maintain the synthesis of these intermediates that you're sort of siphoning off. And so uh, there are sort of the reverse reactions where different enzymes, so for example, um, if you have really low levels of oxaloacetate, you can convert pyruvate directly into oxaloacetate with pyruvate carboxylase. Um, and uh, also, um, uh, uh, sort of another example down here with the malic enzyme, of converting pyruvate into malate. So these are sort of regenerating these, um, if, you're, if you're doing a lot of biosynthesis and you need to maintain the cycle just enough to make these intermediates, there are these extra little enzymes that funnel in, uh, uh, add to the cycle here to maintain the rate of the citric acid cycle so that these intermediates are high enough that they can do these biosynthesis reactions. Okay, so I think I'm just gonna so um, I don't want to get into more of this, so we'll just sort of stop with this. Um, I just want to introduce this idea of the amphibolic pathway. Uh, and for the level of detail here, I really just want you to remember the, um, the names of the intermediates uh, and the sort of class of the biosynthetic molecules, like amino acid, uh, fatty acid, that they would be produced in biosynthetic. Not, not any of these extra enzymes unless for glutamine.